Hathaway Creative Center at 10 Water Street. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Wonderful seeing some new faces, some old faces, and I don't think we have any speaking alumni here this evening, but wonderful to see everyone. Uh, for those of you that have not attended in the past, Central Maine Tech Night is a monthly event in the mid-Maine region that brings technology experts and hobbyists together to network, learn, and share. Uh, you can find us here at BRICS the second Thursday of every month. Uh, you may find us on Facebook or online at centralmaine.org uh, at the Tech Night tab. Uh, I would of course like to thank our wonderful sponsors this evening. This free event is, spons uh, is presented by Central Maine Growth Council and is sponsored by CGI. Thomas College's Harold Alphon Institute for Business Innovation. Uh, Valley Beverage has provided us our lovely cocktails this evening. And BRICS uh, co-working and innovation space. Uh, thank you to BRICS. Uh, in addition, I'd like to say hello to the folks watching at home. Uh, this tech night is being streamed live and can be viewed on Crossroads TV channel 1301. Uh, and thank you so much to the Crossroads TV uh, staff and team uh, and Chad behind the camera. So this evening we do have a special and fun one, uh, especially for uh, drone enthusiasts and hobbyists. Uh, this evening's tech talk is building from a bird's eye view, how tech has taken over the most dangerous, expensive jobs in construction. Uh, this will also feature a live uh, demo tonight. Uh, the presentation will be by Mr. Brad Stout. Uh, Fast, easy, safe, inexpensive, whether it's locating fallen power lines or mapping construction sites, drones perform the visual and thermal inspections that while essential to efforts ranging from emergency response to construction are prohibitively dangerous and expensive. Enjoy incredible drone footage and a live drone demo at this interactive Tech Talk, where we'll be showcasing the impressive capabilities of a drone and drone technology. Uh, join me in welcoming, welcoming Brad. All right, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Brad Stout. I'm the CEO at Coots Brothers. We're in Randolph, Maine. We are a family-owned and operated uh, utility construction company, so we build power lines. One of our lines of business is also inspecting power lines, and that's kind of how we got into the drone business. Um, our company it was founded in 1963 by a couple of brothers and a tractor. Uh, currently, we have over 50 employees performing line work uh, up and down the East Coast uh, throughout New England. So uh, our inspection business uh, is important to utilities because they need to make sure that their assets are reliable. So for the past 25 years, we've been climbing anywhere from 6,000 to 10,000 poles a year to make sure that uh, they're in good shape. So. Uh, one of the inspections we do is climbing, we also test the butts, we do infrared inspections, and now we've incorporated UAS inspections. In uh, 2012, Coots Brothers was looking at uh, working in the helicopter business. Helicopters were used for a lot of inspections, and we were uh, in negotiations with a helicopter company to, to become owners. And uh, this crash happened, this happened in New York after Superstorm Sandy. The helicopter is actually, uh, that field is actually at a school. It's on a playground. Um, the the uh, line worker and the helicopter pilot both passed away in the crash. And that really made us take a second look at what we were doing and if this is a step we really wanted to take. So by 2013, we were into drones. Um, so we started our own program. We hired pilots from, from manned aviation to help us write SOPs. Um, kind of teach us what's going on. And then when we wanted to train our people, we hired a third party uh, to teach us how to fly drones and how to fly safely in the wire environment. We also took the part 107 exam, which is an FAA exam. So that we're licensed to fly commercially with the UAS. If you're just recreational, if you just wanna go out and take pictures of the family or your property, you don't need a license. But if you're gonna do it for hire, any commercial aspect of use, uh, you've gotta have the part 107 license. Coots Brothers uses DJI equipment like we have set up here. Uh, we do that because it's easy, it's reliable, and uh, for me, it's just easy to fly. I'm not that great of a pilot, so um, it's, it's insane how, how easy these are to use. 
Um, our equipment consists of a couple different parts. You have the drone, this has the blades, and then you have a sensor on the bottom. The sensor can be a camera, it could be an infrared sensor that picks up heat. Uh, they have multi-spectral cameras that can read plant health. That's obviously very important and interesting. Um, we've used LiDAR, so you can build out point clouds, gathering data with a LiDAR sensor. Uh, gas detection is another one that we're looking at, um, so that if there was a leak, you'd be able to spot it on a camera from a drone. Um, every drone runs on a battery. Obviously, the controls run on batteries. Uh, it's very important to us that we track the usage of these. All the batteries, if you come around, you'll see our batteries are labeled. Anything like the 210 in front of me has two batteries. Everything's set in pairs. So if one battery fails in a pair, we throw both away. Um, this is our newest uh, toy. Uh, it's a mobile command center. It's a van that's spec'd out to fly. We're working on a beyond visual line of sight solution. Right now, the FAA requires us to fly within line of sight. I have to be able to see the drone as I'm flying it. Once we're exempt from that and we can fly beyond visual line of sight, this van becomes a lot more uh, valuable than it is to us now sitting in the parking lot, right? So uh, it's decked out with four screens. It has a 19-foot uh, pole that you can put your commands, your, uh, your uh, antennas on so you can communicate with the drone. It has uh, AC, heat, so you can have it temperature controlled, humidity controlled. Has a battery backup that'll last six hours. If you, if you didn't have any power, the drone would still be able to fly for six hours. It'd run all your screens in your command center. It also has a 3,000 uh, kW generator underneath the hood. So if the engine's running, it's making 3,000 kW. And it has solar panels on top. So one thing you'll learn if you get into aviation, they want to have duplication and duplication and duplication. So if this doesn't work, what's the next step? So we have three different sources of power here. It's not required, no. It, it, it's gonna make it so we look a lot better to the FAA. Uh, the video is on, th this is us testing out our new drone. You can see it's a fixed wing. It's called VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing. So the propellers point up, right? The same way any of these um, multi-copters do. And then uh, when it gets up to elevation, they flip forward and it flies like propellers on a plane. So it's kind of a neat little rig we're excited to start implementing. Uh, hazards associated with UAS, pretty much everything you'd, you'd have with manned aircraft, right? You have airspace issues, gravity, weather environment, uh, electronic malfunctions, human error clearances. Um, and so here, here's a couple of, I'm just going to lay out a couple of things we do and then we'll open it up to questions so we can get a little more interactive. But um, So these type of structures here, this is part of our inspection. So we would normally be asked to climb this. However, because it's a corner, you can't climb the poles because you're too close to the wires, right? So we have clearances that we have to maintain so you don't get hurt. This one hasn't been climbed in, in decades, literally. So we fly the drone and look for issues. Um, when we were looking at this, our lineman who looks at it, he caught something off this angle. You can't really see it very well from here. But when you zoom in, that cross arm in the back, something doesn't look right, it looks lower than the one in the front. And then when you look from the other side, you can see there's a crack between those two bolts. That cross arm was rotting all the way through. It was just being held up by who knows what, just sitting there. It had been there forever. So that was something that we found we had to change immediately um, to make sure there wasn't an outage. Um, in New York, they had an issue where lightning was hitting uh, these static wires on their substations. So we flew all of the substations checking the static wire for lightning damage. Uh, we did find one area where the lightning had hit. You can, you can see the wire going, and then um, you can see the strains turning. You get to a spot and it just looks like a welded rod. It's just, it's, uh, just brown with no strands. So we, we did find one there. And then storm response. This is a tree we found up in Skowhegan. Um, obviously it's laying on the wire. Uh, it's a valuable piece of information for people to have to go fix this because you can see not only where it is, but you can see what the damage is, right? So when you're walking through a right away in Maine, you don't know if you're going to walk up on broken poles or wire everywhere or how many trees are actually down. If you can provide a photo like this, then the line workers know 
It's two small trees. I need to get a tree crew in here first. It doesn't look like there's any broken poles. The wire obviously isn't broken. It's still holding up the tree. So all they had to bring was some insulators to change on the top and, and a tree crew to fix this. Um, inclement weather, uh, this is, we used actually this drone with a thermal camera. So this was at night. This is down in Wiscasset. Um, I'll, I'll play the video. Oh, I won't play the video. I'll try to play the video. And it doesn't work. All right, anyways. Um, you can see here there's a tree that actually fell between the phases. It's really hard to see using the thermal imagery. But uh, it was, we actually got to find the error so they knew what they had to do. Another one, a couple more trees down on power lines. This is out in western Maine. We flew this one at like 2 o'clock in the morning. They asked us to try to fly it and find the issue so when the crews came off their sleep rest at 5 a.m., they'd know where the problem was and what the problem was. So we were able to deliver that. Where did you have the Sorry, Dan. Yeah. Where would you be to fly this? How far were you sending it? Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you're not in Randolph to go to Western Maine, but I'm wondering where. No, we, we usually get to hide a land so you can see it as far away as you can. And then flying at night, you can actually fly a lot further away because we just have to be able to see it, right? So we put on lights that you can see from six statute miles on the drone so you can see that thing forever. Um, so in this case, we were at height of land. That was about three or 4,000 feet from where we were standing. LIDAR, uh, we did a LIDAR survey in Brunswick. Um, honestly, LIDAR is well over my head. I don't. Uh, you wouldn't be able to make any sense of the data, um, but it is, it, it's data we can collect uh, with these units. Um, so the future for UAS, I kind of mentioned it before, for us, uh, it's really beyond visual line of sight, right? Um, if our goal is to try to replace the patrols that are done with a helicopter currently, we want to remove the man from the aircraft so it reduces the risk of someone getting hurt. We need to be able to fly like a helicopter would from point A to point B and do a good patrol. Um, currently, we don't have that, but we're working on it. We've submitted applications to the FAA. Um, when we get that, we'll be able to do better patrols. Uh, the sensors, so your cameras are geotagged. So as you download the photos and drop them into a map, it shows you exactly where those photos are sent, uh, are, are, are taken from. Um, the newest cameras actually have compasses in them. So not only will it tell you this picture was taken here, but the camera was facing in this direction when it was, when it was taking. So when you drop it into GIS models or, or any type of model, you'll be able to do the Google Earth like street view, and you'll be able to see which direction it was facing, which is, is really interesting stuff. Here's just a couple screenshots. I'll go through this quickly so we don't have to just listen to me talk the whole time. But um, you know, the future for UAS for us is, is AI. So right now, instead of having a man go through every photo that we take and say, is there anything wrong, we're trying to teach you know, computers, Watson, like you see on the commercials, to do this work for us. Um, one thing that's already happening is sorting the, the, the photos by location, stitching photos together to build 360 mo degree models. This right here is just an application we use. It's simple, that point on the middle is on a structure. Any place you see a picture of a camera, that's, a, that's where the picture is going to be taken from, and then the green kind of shows the field of view of what you're going to get. And so you can mess around with that. I don't know how to make the videos play on here, but sometimes it just works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but you can, you can stretch that out. You know, I, I made it look like this. This is what it started like. You can add pictures and uh, make it look different. Yeah, can, if you just hover over it, you can usually hit play. So yeah, this is just how easy it is to build out your model and take the pictures from anywhere you want. If you want to take it from further away or closer, if you want to add a photo, um, pretty simple stuff. Again, if you want to hit play on this one, this is just, uh, this is over in Oakland. We're working on a job site. We wanted to build out um, a 360 degree model of a dig, right? So we, were, we had multiple, machines in here working. So this flies out, it stops over the top of where you want to start your, your, your 360 degree photo, and it just starts taking pictures by itself. It takes 26 photos, starting straight down, and works its way up and out in a circular motion. 
And uh, you can see up in the top right screen, those are the photos it's taking. And then when you, uh, when you build it out, you get this if you want to hit play on that video. You get a 360 degree vo photo that you can just move around with your finger and look in all directions. Pretty neat for us. When I flew this, the construction trucks were moving. So when the trucks move, it makes a little hole in your photo like that. It doesn't really know what to do with that. Um, but pretty good stuff for us. For us, what we use this for is I can fly out over the top of a structure if we need to change it, build a 360 degree model, hand that to my foreman, and he can figure out how to get in and out of that structure. You can see 360 degrees. If there's any issues with landowners or streams, um, you can find a way in. So this is our zoom camera um, we brought in today on the 210. Um, it has the ability to zoom in at up to a, 180 times, 30x optical. So this is at 150 feet of altitude. This is us over our transformer. Um, this is down in Texas. You can see we zoom in. This is the, this is the first zoom, 30x optical. And then uh, when you zoom in again, 180 times, you can read the little sticker sitting next to that. If, you, if we'll go back out, you can kind of see the sticker there. You definitely can't see the sticker from here. So um, it's a pretty valuable tool. Again, 150 feet of altitude, 100 feet outside the substation fence, and you can read the gauges on the transformer. So again, this is, this is one way we're reducing risk to man, right? We're taking the, 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 the risk to man out of the situation by using technology. Some other uses, uh, pesticide, herbicide applications, uh, that's an agris, a DJI agris. We have one of those. Uh, we've been approved by uh, the Maine State Pesticide Board to attempt to fly some blueberry fields and apply pesticide, herbicide. Um, uh, we're still working with the FAA to make sure that, that happens. Uh, stockpiles and volumetrics, we can fly maps, build 3D models. You can take measurements off that, progress tracking in construction sites, uh, maps for access and scouting, and then search and rescue. The thermal is a very good tool for search and rescue. We've worked with um, Lincoln County a little bit, testing out some of the search and rescue techniques. This is, uh, this is a gravel pit we flew in Augusta. Um, this builds out an elevation model. So this is the 3D model. You can see the uh, blue is actually the Kennebec River. And as you work up the hill, uh, it changes in elevation and the red is, is the top of the gravel pit. It's pretty interesting. The day I was there, they were getting ready to shoot some, uh, some rock. So they had drilled a bunch of holes to fill with dynamite to shoot it. Um, the, the blasting company charges the, the pit owner by the yard. So whatever he shoots, that's what he pays for. And so I took this measurement, came out to about 5,200 yards. And I, I called him up and asked, I said, how much do you think you shot? And he, he, we were gonna shoot, he's like, oh, about 5,000. So we were pretty close, uh, just guessing off this. So it's, a, it's, it's an interesting tool, um, interesting tool to use, real valuable when it comes to aggregates. Um, oh, this is just another 3D model we made at the shop. Uh, if you don't mind hitting play on that one. <clears throat> just to show how easy it is. Uh, you, you can hand this to anybody. You know, if we want to fly this site here, we could turn this over to you folks and you'd be able to look at uh, the same model that we see. But this is just Coots Brothers. There's our new solar panels. Pretty proud of those. All of our poles you can look in either direction. Down in the fields out back, you can zoom in. Pretty neat stuff. All right. So we can go through these questions or you guys can ask your questions. It's up to you. Go. Uh, DJI, what is that? Uh, DJI. DJI is just a name brand. Yep. Um, these are made in China. So federal agencies aren't real excited about them, right? Uh, but we use them. So, and they're, they're very effective. But it's just a name brand. It's, uh, last time I read they had 65% of the market share. So I mean, they're the most popular by far, and it's easy to get. If I need new blades, I can order them online and have them in a day. So, yeah. Any other questions? So when you're doing different types of surveying, like LIDAR or like temperature, does that mean you have to get all the new gear for obviously each one, so there's a new piece of hardware, there's a bunch of different things? 
Yeah, yeah, so LiDAR and thermal would be different sensors, right? Multispectral would be a different sensor. Um, a lot of your surveying you can do just with a camera, right? Um, the software is really what's key. I mean, the software has come along so far in the past 12 months, it's ridiculous. If I come back here and talk to you guys next May, it's gonna be the same way again, right? The, the growth is incredible. Um, when we first started, just as simple as this, when I first started doing these two years ago, I started uploading my pictures. So like today I went out and I flew that site. I took 783 photos with a 24 megapixel camera. That's a lot of data, right? So when I started this two years ago, someone would have to sit there like almost overnight. You'd start in the morning, you'd have to stay next to your computer till eight or nine o'clock at night just to upload the photos. Just the internet speeds at my office have gotten so much faster, I uploaded the photos in a half an hour this, this afternoon. That's just how quickly these things happen. So uh, the processing speeds, it used to take four to six days for me to get my map back. I uploaded my photos and it said five to 12 hours, you'll get your map back. You know, everything's just faster and better. It, it, it's, it's outrageous how quickly these things go. But yeah, the cost in, in, in sensors is, is expensive. The software is where we're starting to spend more money now, now that we're geared up. Is anybody else here using UAS for anything? So who is it serving? Serving. Yep. Yep, uh, it's, it's great for that. Yeah, it, it's great for progress photos as well. You know, to, if you have a greenfield site that has nothing and, and to be able to fly out once a month and see your progress, very interesting. So I always ask this, what are the barriers to UAS? So it, is there an application you could be using UAS but you're not? And then what is the barrier to that? Is it cost, right? Is it, uh, is it risk? Is it training? You know, it's interesting to think about why, why wouldn't you use this technology? I mean, it's, it's, it's all in what you want to do. I mean, this, this, is, this is basically all I fly. This is all they let me fly, right? So, but I mean, for four grand, I can do pretty much anything you want me to do with this, right? For $4,000. And when we started, we were buying something way less capable than that for $40,000, okay? So I still like this, right? Um, and if you start getting into to these, I mean, both the sensors on there, you're, you're talking thousands for each sensor, uh, yeah, right? Not tens of thousands. Um, the UAS itself is fairly inexpensive and then you upfit it with all the stuff you need and yeah, it gets expensive. So I mean, uh, we spent a lot of money getting in, right? We've been doing it since 2013. We spent a lot of money the wrong way, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but now we've made those mistakes. We have the inherent knowledge we, we do things the right way now. We're, we're very productive, very safe, very efficient. We're good, so. So what, would someone, what should someone look for when they're going shopping for one of these? Like what are some of the criteria that, that they need? If they're gonna spend this much money, you yeah. know, it takes wisely. Yeah. Um, you know, I would look for reliability. Right now there's a lot of new brands coming onto the market. They're promising a lot of things. I don't know how well I would trust those promises. Um, the reason we've stuck with DJI the way we have is it always comes through the way they say it's gonna come through. That's, that's the, it's the most reliable. Um, other than that, I would do research on what you're actually trying to do, right? It took us a while to figure out what, what are we actually trying to do with these? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and once we got that nailed down, then we got the right hardware in house. Could you tell us a story like maybe general terms from maybe a customer who said, wow, this, this was like mind blowing for them how well that it worked for them for their application that they were brought in to do. Yeah. Anything you can tell us in general terms about I mean, so you gotta remember the space we're in, right? right. So we're, we're in the utility space, and one thing that we've committed to is we really wanna try to stick to that as much as we can, right? I mean, they want, after hurricanes, they ask us, will you go fly roofs in, in, in the south? You know, uh, do you wanna go do real estate? There's, there's a million things you can do with these drones, right? And we're trying to stick to utility. So for us, you know, the real aha moment, I showed you guys the picture of that tree in Skowhegan. You know, it was, I think it was February. So it's like 10 degrees out. 
and you, how much snow is in the right of way in Skowhegan in February? I mean, we're talking like four feet of snow. There's not a snowmobile trail there. Um, it would have been a real pain in the butt for someone to go in and go walk down that line or ride a snowmobile down the line in the snow to try to figure out what's there. And for us, the way it worked is it's kind of cool. Um, you know, you, you pop the SD card out of this and you slide it right in your laptop and the picture's right there. And I had it emailed to the transmission manager within five minutes, you know, it was just that quick. Here's your problem, this is where it is. So that was kind of the aha moment for them. I'm like, wow, we didn't send a helicopter up. You know, we didn't have to send a guy in there unprepared. Uh, it, it's just a, it's an easy resource to use that, that isn't taken advantage of quite as much as people think. So they're able to email you, so the pictures that you're producing, so they're just smaller, lower res files that um, typically an email might bounce back something like 10 megs, but maybe you have, you've had to increase it to handle the amount of megabytes you send it through. Yeah, you bring up, you bring up a great point, right? So I, I have a Mac, so when I go to hit send, it's like, do you want low, medium, high, right? So for something like this, you can send it low and they're, you're good, right? But you know, one of the first projects we did, I was telling you about the static wires, we found that bad spot and we emailed it off to, to all the people we were supposed to email it off to and they said, we don't see anything. I'm like, okay, you know, let's have a conference call because I'm in Maine, my crew's in New York, these guys are in a different part of New York. And we're talking on the phone. I'm like, yeah, you know, look at the photo. This is the photo number. Go to the left side, zoom in, you'll see. You, you can't miss it. Nope, I don't see anything. We're like, are you, what's going on? They're like, are you looking at the right photo? Well, he had a screen from the mid 90s, right? It's low resolution. You literally couldn't see it. So, one of the things that we've learned is you got to, I mean, we have like the nicest Mac 5K screen this big, so nobody can miss anything, you know, at our office. but. You kind of have to start educating your clients on, you know, the, this isn't valuable information to you if you don't have a screen you can't see it on. You know, this isn't valuable information for you if you don't have some way to store this data. You know, and what we found is a lot of our clients only want to see what's bad. You know, if we go out and take 700 photos, just send me the three that show something bad. I don't want to see the rest. And they don't want them cataloged, they don't want them saved, they just, they only want what's bad. So I think what we're gonna see is as, as this industry grows and people realize how valuable this data is, they're gonna say, no, I need all 700 of them. I need them uploaded here in this format so that we can go back and, and, and access them at a later time. Because, uh, you know, so our clients are power companies, right? So when the power goes out, the PUC says, why did the power go out? So it'd be valuable for them to say, well, a drone flew this last year and it was fine. So something happened. We're, we're trying to keep up with our inspections, you know? It would be valuable information. Any other questions? Do you see in the future that drones will, will supplant actually humans doing some of the roles? Like right now you're doing inspections, do you see in the future that it will be inspections and actual repairs? I, not in my lifetime. Okay. You know, I, I don't see that. What, what I see is just some of the riskier jobs, there's, there's tasks within those jobs that can be removed, right? So a drone is not gonna replace a line worker. Right. Not gonna happen. But could a drone make it so the line worker doesn't have to go in to read that gauge, doesn't have to put on PPE, doesn't have to go stand within 10 feet of a high voltage line? Yeah, definitely, it can do that part for you, right? So that, that's really where I see it. It's gonna be a combination effort. Um, you know, drones are not gonna replace helicopters, right? It's just not gonna happen. But there's a bunch of tasks that we use helicopters now for that have the risk of manned aircraft that we can get rid of. Anything else? We good? Even like when you take one and you get the truck, what's going to be the furthest away you can fly this thing? So the aircraft, yeah, the, that aircraft that I showed you, um, it's being built to fly 47 miles. So that's not really going to happen right away though, right? Um, so we're hoping to be, by this, this summer, we're hoping to be able to fly 3.1 miles outside of line of sight. What's that? It is close, but you gotta figure 3.1 miles, that gets you quite a ways down the, I say it's a lot of four wheeler riding or walking down the right away. So uh, it, it's, it's still valuable. You know, with, with the SCADA systems the way they are in, in, in our industry, when there is a fault, you can usually tell where the fault is, right? It's usually 
5,000 to 8,000 feet from the substation. So if you can fly those 3,000 feet, you can usually find the error. You gotta be able to see it. Without any, without binoculars or anything extra, right? You just gotta be able to see it. So that's why flying at night, you can see it. You put nice lights on it, you can see it a long ways. Anything else? Good, well thanks for coming guys. I appreciate your time. skills here at play, or your aeronautical <laughs> skills on uh, point here, but do you want to just turn it on and just... Who's I? You're welcome to. Yeah, I definitely want to go fly this. All right. <laughs> just... Yeah, yeah, I can see it. Here, you can see, yeah. So we can see, I'm not sure if you guys want to check it out, or... But there's, uh, this is a thermal image, so there's the cameraman back there, he's hot. Everything around him's cold. Yeah. Let's see if we can scroll, zoom over on him. Oh, wow. oh, he's right in the way. Oh, oh, so you can. Cold bottle of water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you turn that a little more for the back as well? You'd have to turn that for the back as um, Turn what? The controller. Stop moving. Yep. So this would uh, this would be considered radiometric. So every pixel. So if that camera takes a photo, every pixel takes a temperature reading. So uh, that's real easy for artificial intelligence, right? Because it's just a number. So you can, set, you can dump in as many photos as you want and say, anytime you see anything over 100 degrees, give me that photo and it'll pump them out for you. So thermal imaging and, and AI is actually uh, pretty well advanced. Fantastic. Yeah, so then we can also switch over to our zoom camera. So here we are. See if we can enhance. <laughs> you can see the hair on the top of his head. That's at 30. So it goes to, <laughs> goes to 180. Wow. Can't really see much now. So that's, I mean, that's valuable when you get wide open spaces, right? That's where that gets valuable. We have the little one too, we guys can see, this is called a spark. This is uh, like basically fits in your pocket. You fly it on your cell phone. Real easy if you just wanna go up and take a look at something. Uh, my brother-in-law is restoring a building in Gardner and uh, under, underneath where the roof line kind of meets the, the top of the, the, the siding, there's a bunch of fancy decorative work. And from the ground, you can't really tell with a camera whether it's wood or metal. And so we flew up got pretty close, snapped a couple pictures. You could tell it was wood, there's wood grain behind it. Um, so it was valuable for him. Uh, that's, that's really easy to fly. Really, really easy to fly. Do you know how much the sparks go for? I think the sparks are like 400, four or 500 bucks. Um, like I said, you fly it on your cell phone, it has sensors in the front so you can't crash it in. As long as you fly forward, you can't crash it. So it like fly up to the wall and say you're 10 feet away, six feet away and they just won't let you get any closer. Yeah, so all these have those sensors. This one has it all the way around. This one only has it in the front on the bottom. Who controls the rules and regulations for cameras? The FAA. FAA. Yeah, FAA. FAA. Yep, who's, so who's that? Federal Aviation Administration. So they do, you know, what, what happened, and this is an interesting thing, they, they're, they're tasked with keeping the airways safe, right? They're, they're making sure it's safe to fly for manned aircraft, and then they just dumped this whole drone thing on their lap, and as they'll tell you, they didn't fund it. So they're not really super excited about making it easy to fly drones. Um, they actually really don't like anybody who flies drones, from my experience. So um, you have to follow their rules, and they make a lot of rules, and they change them a lot, and it's kind of a pain in the butt. But that's why you have the 107 test, that's part of the FAA's law, and that's what we do. Yeah, you have to understand all of the airspace. Yeah. So you need to be able to read uh, uh, airspace. You need to know all the rules about airspace, like stuff that I'm never gonna use. Like, does this mean you can fly at 14,000 feet or 12,000 feet? Like, I have to know that. 
even though this doesn't go above 400 feet. So uh, you have to learn all that. You have to learn how to read the weather. You have to learn emergency procedures. Uh, this is all the stuff you'd teach a pilot other than how to f actually fly, but all the rules and regulations. Yep, I'm not looking forward to my uh, update test here in two years. <laughs> Yeah, it is. It's hard. I mean, we get, we get, five of us took the test and we all passed, but I know all five of us put a lot of time into it too. So, well, unless there aren't any more questions, uh, join me in thanking Brad. Thank you so much. That was spectacular. Um, hearing about some of the technology and the utility um, and some of those case models, I thought were particularly interesting and provided really nice context. Thank you for folks watching at home. Uh, for joining us here at BRICS at Hathaway Creative Center downtown at 10 Water Street. Find us online or on Facebook uh, or join us in person the second Thursday of every month. Uh, so thank you and we hope to see you again shortly. <laughs>